Hi, welcome to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the film series with lively discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach cinema studies at the College of Staten Island of the City University of New York. Today we continue our five-part series that we're calling Scrambled Time. It's about films that challenge linear storytelling. Today we'll be seeing the 1963 Czechoslovakian film, Death is Called Ingolchen. It was directed by Jan Kadar, who's perhaps best known in this country for his Academy Award-winning film, The Shop on Main Street. The film we'll be seeing today was made several years before that, and in the opinion of a number of film historians and critics, is a superior film. It's a World War II story. It's a story of a partisan who is recounting to himself many of the things that he did over the period of the war. We'll be talking about it as an example of scramble time film, and as an example of the Czech New Wave, and a number of other things after today's screening. As usual, we have two guests. Today they are Professor Albert Todd of Queens College and Professor Hannah Arya Gaifman of New York University. Enjoy Death is Called Ingolchen. <laughs> of the late. Oh, hi. Welcome back to Cinema Then, uh, Cinema Now. I hope you enjoyed Death is Called Ingolchen, a uh, extraordinary film, I think. A long film, but an extremely rich film in its psychological portrait, not only of the central character, but of many of the characters uh, surrounding him. Before we go on to place this film in a set of traditions and talk about it, let me introduce today's uh, two guests. Sitting to my left is Professor Albert Todd of Queens College of the City University of New York. Uh, Bert teaches uh, a number of courses there in um, Russian literature and language. He is a distinguished translator working, many of you may know him for his work on Yevtushenko's uh, poetry and prose, and he teaches a number of courses in Russian and Eastern European film at Queens College. Over to my right from another part of uh, New York's university culture is uh, Professor Hannah uh, Arya Gaifman. Hannah is a professor of um, Slavic and comparative literature at NYU, where she's a specialist in Slavic poetics and in modern Czech uh, literature. Hannah, let's stick with modern Czech literature just for um, a second or so. This um, uh, film is taken from a novel. I'm not familiar with the novel. Who's the author and where does he fit in some general way in modern Czech? Or, or is it Slovak literature? First of all, it's Slovak literature. And Ladislav Miačko is one of those l'enfant terrible of Slovak literature. Uh, and this novel in particular was one of the first raising doubts and questions and uh, him having troubles right. with the Czech regime or Czechoslovak regime, then still quite Stalinist. Uh, Mnyačko uh, became more or less legal again in the later 60s, uh, visited Israel in 67, went back to Europe in 68, and then left again Czechoslovakia when uh, mm. the Russians came. Uh, I don't know right now where he Okay, but, now, but, but, but he's one of those people who, at least in the novel, was challenging the official ideology definitely, in definitely. the 50s and, and, through, and, and through the 60s. And the second question about the relationship of, of uh, this film to the sort of general context of modern uh, Czech literature or the narrative arts is, um, 
is there a tradition in Czechoslovakian literature of this kind of temporal displacement in, um, I in plots. You know, in the, in the West, when you take a college course, perhaps you're helping change these things these days, um, and certainly Milan Kundra has made a few of his statements about how these things should be changed. The, the general story you get is, well, Faulkner, Joyce, and Virginia Woolf, they changed a lot of things in the, in, in the 1920s. Um, are there some uh, other people we should be giving a lot of credit uh, well, we shouldn't forget that there are two Prague authors who have determined the Central European literature to quite a, quite an extent. It's the German writing author Franz Kafka, who right. of course used Czech at least in his private correspondence quite a bit, and the Czech author Jaroslav Hasek. Right. And they both played with time and space quite, uh, I would say, imaginatively and definitely would not be put to shame either by Joyce or by Virginia Woolf. Right, right. And uh, both, as we know, died in the very early 20s, so they were really... Right, so, so they're really there at this m moment, um, uh, moment of this. Okay, well, I think I'd like to try to chat, ask Bert now about it. It's certainly a different kind of context for it. Bert, uh, you and I actually, on one or two occasions past, did some talking about... Um, the traditions of representing war, that sort of thing, in Russian and in East, Euro East European film. Well, this is a film about a, a, about a partisan. What do you think of as some of the um, cliches of filmmaking about revolutionary leaders or, or partisans, and how does this film, uh, in your mind, uh, uh, avoid uh, uh, those, or does it? Well, it, yes, it does. In, in a certain dimension, the, the leadership here is humanized, and they're frail, and they do make mistakes. And, and one of the underlying themes of the film, which comes out dramatically at the end, is that war is a time where people make mistakes. Uh, yeah. And the mistakes that they make uh, cannot be undone. They have terrible consequences. And the leadership uh, is shown making mistakes. Um, the Russian commander at one point is playing around with a weapon that he doesn't understand. Oh. It explodes and for frivolous reasons he is killed and a number of others are killed or injured. Um, the other leadership faults or fails at several times in understanding who is the enemy or what the situation is and at one point, however, to counter right. pose the um, issue of tradition uh, which does appear here, I think, in very traditional forms also. The Russians, after all, do play a dominant role. Moscow they is calling, Moscow is calling. Mos it starts with Moscow as being in charge, and we, the role of the Russian leadership is clear throughout the operation, both of the espionage w right. uh, and the partisan activities themselves. The commander of the partisans, though it's a Czech brigade, is a Russian, and there are several other Russians in the mm -hmm. unit. And the leadership of the Russians is very sure at all points. They never let anything escape. Now, this is probably historically quite tr correct, but there are implications there that are probably not true. Right. Well, but you also, I, I would like to come back to the point you made earlier, I, um, and that is that the, the Russian leader is killed. I mean, first of all, he's the one who um, does not say, well, why would this fellow be a collaborator? And mm -hmm. then second mm -hmm. of all, he's the one who ends up in the terrible destruction when, when, uh, as you say, uh, dealing with this weapon that he, that he doesn't understand. So. But it, most of all, I think he fails to understand within the film what I think is the central or a central theme of the film, and that is the plight of Martha, the fate of yes. woman. Woman is, after all, the heroic figure in this film more than anyone else. And her sacrifice is the greatest. And the mistakes that are made by others that they pay for are greatest in her case. Right. As she says once uh, to her lover, friend, the narrator of the film, the wounded Czech leader, she says, Pavel, she says, uh, you know, you're crippled, but you're going to walk again. <laughs> and I'm, I will always be a cripple for what she has done. She will always be maimed. Her sacrifice is, is very great. But the Russian commander specifically does not understand this right. over the issue of um, whether the suspected spy is, who's trying to be recruited by the partisans is really uh, genuine or not. Uh, he shows his 
scars and says, yes, yes. You know, here's proof that I'm who I am. And they seem to or want to accept that. And the Czech, uh, Pavel, doesn't want to accept that. The Russian says, but would a man let himself be <laughs> abused this way just to be a spy? And the Czech says, yes, but what about Martha, who did yeah. just that? And the Czech says, and the, the Russian's reply to that is that she doesn't count. Yeah. And then shot. Which, I well, mean, no, please go on. Sorry, but I think that uh, she doesn't count in a different way. Yes, I mean, yes, she's precisely. Definitely pr uh, I think he actually understands her very well. She is really above us all. She's willing to sacrifice everything, and she does. That's why we also do believe, at least at the beginning, that she's dead, and she actually does attempt suicide, because she has sacrificed everything. Yes, and he's and the one that says that she has uh, done, she's worth more than all of our right. brigade together. So that the Czech spy cannot really be compared to her. No, no. And uh, in fact, she does not find her way back to that Czech society. No, and she doesn't return. She's lost. Uh, what, how do you understand the end of the film, though? Is she ever to be found? Is she lost forever? She has to find her own way. Of course, there is this wonderful reversal. She comes to Pavel as Ruth, quoting from mm -hmm. the Book mm -hmm. of Ruth, mm -hmm. uh, not finding, actually sheltering him. It's the first time that he finds quiet. He finds peace with her. Mm -hmm. And when she is supposed to find her peace, she leaves. Well, so it's the reversal, really, of, of Ruth's position. Well, the, uh, I it's interesting, since just to continue on the line of this and the sort of traditional representation of heroic partisans in the war experience, of course everybody suffered, but suffered so there would be a conclusion and the future would be clear in a certain kind of way. But one of the things that's very interesting about this film is that, one, we know that she has survived. We, we first assume that she has not. Martha, but she mm -hmm. survived, but her particular fate and how she will be able to work it out in a post-war society is left open. That is, we know internally she will have that, so that's not closed at the end. And Ingolchen has escaped uh, himself, and uh, Pavel goes off looking for him, but that last shot of Pavel is, is not one, is not the traditional cowboy walking into the sunset. It's a crippled man, hob hobbling down the street looking for a, a, a war criminal who clearly has had a, a set of advantages uh, that he has not had. And this is the scene that follows his encounter with the mother, the old mm -hmm. village woman whose house was destroyed, and she now waits or, or tries to get some cement to rebuild her home. That actually these people who were helping the partisans have lost everything and they have to start again, and it's not quite clear uh, how well they will succeed. Oh, yes. It and I kind of feel that the real motto is, is Pavel's sentence when the doctor asks him, well, didn't you suspect this Czech guy as being a, a spy? I mean, how, what did you do? He says, well, you know, the problem is that whatever you do, you make mistakes. Yeah. That and this, in a way, is also extremely revolutionary. In, these, in the war films of Eastern Europe at that time. I mean, even raising doubts about the righteousness and rightness of the partisans. The fact that they deserted the village and let these people die and the village to be burnt, and when they come back, they say, yeah, behaved uh, terribly. This is interesting to me in the context of the, uh, of the hospital and the way in which the hospital is this clean, uh, as it's represented, is this clean, well-run environment. It would presumably suggest that, that this society will be like this, well-run, in, uh, in this way afterwards. And yet, uh, trapped in this bed, of course, he's reliving all of these uh, experiences. And I'm, I'm, it's, it's fascinating to me how the, uh, the space of that single uh, hospital room uh, is used in so many uh, different ways. Even the, even the bed, uh, the camera is positioned so that it can either be something quite beautiful and clean mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and healthy, or it can be a site of almost expressionist distortion of, um, of, in, of, of internal feelings. 
Um, that, that strikes me as being linked to what you were talking about, Bert, um, uh, uh, earlier, this instability that we find in this world. In, uh, uh, m m it's a moral instability. Uh, that's not characteristic of the, the, a lot of the other war films. Yeah, and it's in the hospital once again that the theme of woman is uh, restated because the nurse is the uh, one of the three f principal women characters, and she's uh, portrayed in a complex role that we don't fully o understand. I don't know if the novel ever reveals her background, but we don't really understand her character, but her own uh, confusion, her own loss, and her own in inability to solve what are her problems right. are well pronounced in there. Yet at one point where Martha has come back to him in the hospital and uh, then is to leave and says goodbye forever, uh, Pavel tries to stop her. And there's this marvelous shot where the two women are in the frame together facing each other for just a moment and we see the woman who suffered so very much, who is the, the whore, as she said, I've been a whore spy. And next to her is the beautiful uh, angel, if you would, to right. introduce a theme that I think is running through there, the angel of, uh, of goodness. And they're thrust together, and he is trying to, and cannot, help or deal or answer or gain from either one of them what he wants. Oh, yes. And they both leave him. Yes, that's that's very interesting because, you know, the 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 way in which the nurse begins, as uh, an idealized uh, yeah. angel. You you mm. mentioned something uh, earlier about the um, humanizing of the of the patriot partisan a uh, partisan hero, but uh, the environment of the hospital is something in which we see her, the nurse nun, increasingly humanized. Through her, through her contact. I mean, she really comes out of a world of idealized behavior. And of course, there is the intimations of a kind of erotic awakening. Oh, yes. Uh, in in yes. The, the, the scene with her, the, the taking off of the, of the hat and the, and the looking, which uh, is, is not treated as, um, as, as good or bad. It's not good, she's waking up, she's, you know, she shouldn't be a nun. Rather, it's this impact that the encounter with someone Whose, prof whose experiences have been so profound uh, as Pavel's are. That, that, at least that's how I take it. Oh, oh yes, and uh, she, the way she responds to Pavel's uh, admonishment to her at the day of victory, when the world is celebrating, that she should go out, uh, she should take off this costume and put on something else, anything that's, as long as it's different, and, and go out and do something she's never done before. Uh, embrace the first man that she meets. Uh, these words come to her with such force, and her re response to them are a revelation of the degree to which she is a tormented and unhappy and unfulfilled person. But at the same time, we have to remember again, this is a movie produced in Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. in 1963, mm -hmm. right. and to have a nun yep. as such a heroine is really quite That's unexpected. Very good, yeah. And uh, with all the questions, she has more inner moral support from her religious life. She's torn, she's hesitating, but she says, everybody is in the streets, I have to stay here. Yes, she's making the sacrifice. She is, yes. and she has some kind of a moral integrity. In, in that situation, she has her obligations. Well, th this, Hannah, brings me to this uh, interesting point. We have the point. two no, nuns, on. right? We have, the, we have Martha, who has sacrificed everything, and we have the Catholic nun, now, of course, Martha is, it is at least hinted at that she's Jewish. In the novel, mm -hmm. it's much clearer that she's Jewish. Is it? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, this mm -hmm. encounter of any kind of, of and, and of course, war. in uh, in a not fully post-Stalinist Czechoslovakia of '63, you have two marginalized kinds of women: a woman defined as Jewish and a woman defined as a member of a religious of a religious order. Well, what I'm uh, what I'm interested in, um, we talked about the the moral instability of this, but this is a this is also a film that uh, destabilizes our interpretations of so many not, uh, of the events and 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 characters. I'm thinking of the 
of the initially of the opening of the film and the way in which it, it to me reveals the method of the film that we see the attack upon the house of Ingolchen twice and we not only do we see it twice but with uh, the that to my mind extraordinary roving camera that they're using we experience it twice I mean we're in the house with Pavel and so much of its point of view uh, shots as he's making the discoveries and looking looking through the through the rooms but those opening scenes to me are emblematic of this m narrative method in the film that almost any incident we come to is inevitably going to be challenged how we initially took mm -hmm. it uh, in that do you think that's uh, uh, well, that definitely, one would say that uh, Kadar and Nyachko are really subverting every initial idea or initial situation. After all, Engelhen's house is empty. The only person we actually see is Martha, who we think is dead. And Pavel is not shot in a combat or in a real fight. He's shot in his back the last day of the war. And he's saved by a, col uh, by a real collaborator yeah. who is trying yeah. to, to save his own right. skin. Yes. Right. right. So uh, there is everything is somehow being subverted. We could almost say it's the predated deconstruction. Right. right. Every <laughs> idea <laughs> that is presented <laughs> is being deconstructed. Well, it is true. It, c it comes back. At, I mean, let's just talk about Martha for the second. I mean, I assume, along with Pavel, that when he discovers her, that she is dead. And mm -hmm. so the, the shock is that she comes back. And just when you think the film is going to not have its full courage, that, okay, they're going to bring her back, somehow they'll get, they'll get, to, um, get, to get together, right. you know. Then she comes in and she tells us about how she cannot escape her own suffering mm -hmm. and, and goes off to this unknown fate of, 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 of contemplation and not not allowing them to get back uh, uh, together. Well, again, it's the subverting of the possible happy ending, but it's also the subverting of the role of a woman. We don't have one single young, happy woman mm. in that film. Yes. We have this young girl in the, in the house who is having affairs with all the partisans, who is a very likable character after all. She mm. does right. follow them and she pays with her life by following them. And she does so out of kindness. She, and so she wants to make them she happy. Won't, exactly. Yes. It's not uh, any kind of, there is no moral judgment yes. on her. Yes. We have the old woman who, who accepts them as they are and never judges them. We have Martha and we have the sister Elizabeth, right, the nurse. So there is no, no idealized, socialist, realist, mother, wife, and sister. Mm -hmm. There's a, None of that. Uh, there's an extraordinary film that we've shown in this series before, uh, Andrei Tarkovsky's uh, Ivan's Childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, unusual in a whole set of ways, but there is an, an, uh, a sort of r aborted romance, not a fair, but romance in it between an officer and a, I believe she's a member of the medical corps, therefore she's an officer in the Soviet, in the Soviet army. And there is, uh, in that relationship, the these hints of suffering, hints of what we would now jokingly call burnout, I mm -hmm. mean, battle fatigue or, 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 or whatever. Yet, all of that is within the bounds of remaining heroic and really not overstepping what is ultimately an extremely conservative and puritanical moral code. That is, there will be a lyric walk in the woods together with something a bit strange about it because there's a longing they can't express there. Now that uh, strikes me as I am to admire Tarkovsky's Ivan's Childhood extremely, but that's quite different from presenting a woman who is, uh, uh, I think you were being so, so, so kind in saying having affairs with all the, the, the minutes. <laughs> okay, sleeping with sleeping all the Sleeping with all the, the ab absolutely. But uh, yet seeing that in the very concrete context of what the life of these partisans are and what the possibilities of happiness are. There's, there's nothing philosophical about it. It's quite concrete. What can you offer if you really want to do uh, something for them? And, and she jumps out of that bed to iron his pants, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I don't quite know whether it's the irony vis a vis the Czechs and the Czech housewife or is it you know, this infinite kindness. Because <laughs> she does get upset yeah. that he wants to be elegant for Martha, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And Very. So there's, th there's that, well, there's that strange operation of, of the sort of normal jealousy under these extraordinary conditions. So it's a, the camp follower, kind-hearted camp follower, is now getting jealous about his visit to the spy prostitute. And yet this is all as if they were, you know, it was uh, one girlfriend upset about going to the other girlfriend. And that, that dissonance is what makes it, because uh, it's not normal. I mean, their circumstances are so uh, terrible uh, in, the, in, in, in the film. Well, we might extend the Prague ironies, or whatever Hrabal calls the Prague ironies, to the Slovak ironies. I think that this is a classical example of this kind of uh, seeing the, the funny or the, the comic in, in those tragic situations, right? Right. It's yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, let me, let me stick out with this, with this context of, of, of how an audience uh, would, receive the, uh, would have received this film. Now, this film was a critical and, and popular success. That's not what I'm really interested in. Kadar and his partner, Klaus, were in trouble any number of, uh, of, uh, of times. Well, now here's a story about a brave, suffering partisan, etc. But uh, I think we both know that World War II has not always, in Czechoslovak film, been only World War II. How would... Um, what other ways of reading this film do you find? Well, there is, of course, the, the subtext of the 50s and the collaboration with, with the regime and with the Stalinist trials, right? Uh, and there is, of course, the hero, Pavel, where the subtext to it would be the Czech, uh, actually invented hero, Julius Fučík, who was uh, according to the latest sources of suspicions, who a was double he? agent. Okay, well, who was he, he was before we knew he was a double agent? Because I'm not sure <coughs> well, everybody knows who he was. He was a very famous communist journalist in Prague. Then he was a member of the Czech Communist Underground, uh, was imprisoned, tortured, and finally executed. During his imprisonment, he has written what is called. Uh, the reportage on the gallows, uh, which these these little letters were smuggled out by a policeman. Now one always asks, how could this guard or the policeman in prison agree to smuggling out this stuff? I mean, this was life endangering. On the other hand, also, how could this man endanger his mm -hmm. guard? Mm -hmm. right. Did he really think himself that important? I mean, this became the this monumental document of heroism, right? So okay. Inverted commas, but actually, uh, in the situation itself, it was it was absolutely ridiculous to have uh, to endanger someone else's life just to get uh, your own story out. Okay. So. And in fact, there is a suspicion that these things were not at all written in prison, but were written by his wife after the war. <laughs> <laughs> for so self-promoting. Uh, for well, there was a need for a mythological hero. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the Czechs did not have that many members of the underground to have a documented hero. Right. So this. So was this would be uh, so to a, to a, a Czechoslovakian audience in 1963. Th this would be a, a very obvious reference. I mean, when we're sure. talking about taking apart a mythologized hero. Um, and the whole mythology, of course, of the ideal partisans, the mythologized hero, the beautiful, young, strong, courageous, uh, wonderful, uh, active. Uh, and of course, a uh, situation like this, the one was the, was the German officer who goes actually to the village to right. look for milk for his soldiers. And uh, they catch him. And Pavel discussed. The officer holds a novel by Thomas Mann, right. a forbidden author. And it's again the role of a book of an author that is introduced here. And we know how uh, literature has been treated in totalitarian regimes, not just under Nazis. Right. We are reliving it right now. It's not by chance that Havel is such an important figure in Czechoslovakia today. And uh, Pavel. Uh, 
is struck by that, and he has a whole philosophical discussion with, with this officer. And of, this officer refers to Descartes, to, and reinterprets uh, cogito ergo sum into as long as ich denke, bin ich ein Mensch, as long as I think I am a human being. Pavel takes this book and sees that the novel was taken from a library of a Jew. And at that moment, he's taken by anger. He stops thinking, and then he is capable of shooting this right. officer. Right? Yes. He ceases to be a human being for that moment. Uh, you know, but it, let's talk again about this 50s sort of, right. uh, sort of referent, because one of the things that both of you have talked about is the fact that this film does say, in certain situations, everyone makes mistakes. Right. And so I think uh, y you can very easily, uh, happily easily, you can read all of the mistakes of the repression of Stalinism of the 50s and the 60s right onto this. I mean, partisans who are making hard decisions are, please correct me if you think I'm wrong, identical in a certain reading to party members who are making hard decisions under economic, given the international situation of the 50s, and yet they're going to make decisions that needlessly make people suffer and are, and are going to be wrong decisions. Uh, I, I would go even further because okay, these partisans uh, made mistakes but still try to, they were one of the, the few who were fighting the Nazis, the dictatorial regime. If the parallel is the, dic the, the Stalinist regime, right? right? And after all, we are in 63 and that's already allowed to think of the early 50s as not the ideal period of Czechoslovak history, then the questions are, uh, questions are? Uh, well, uh, the fellow travelers. OK. We, we, we cannot name those fellow travelers now or go any further because our 30 minutes <laughs> are, are up. If you'd like more information about Cinema Then, Cinema Now, or about cinema studies, graduate or undergraduate, Drop us a line. Drop it to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. Let me give you that information again, okay? Drop it to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. Well, Bert, thanks for bringing your expertise here about this extraordinary tradition of filmmaking we should all know. Um, more about. Glad to have you back on the show. Hannah, pleasure having you for your first visit on the show and with your wide-ranging knowledge of things modern and uh, Czech. Hope to see you again. Well, as usual, I hope that our thought and discussion here lead you to thought and discussion at home that you enjoy. Thanks for joining us.